Welcome to WOE and welcome to our guests who are here to discuss this topic that affects so, so many of us and will continue to in the years to come. We have with us today, each of them has actually had personal experience with caregiving and now has also had some involvement in their professional lives. So with us today we have Amy Boyer who is the caregiving expert for AARP, PK Fields, who is the CEO of a brand new website that's been developed and the easiest way to describe it as Yelp for Elder Care. It's called Our Time. And we also have Beth Harris, who uh, was a an artist and experienced being a caregiver for her mom and managed to find the humor in it and wrote a book about it. Lynn Forbes, co-founder of Woe. The reality is by 2030, there will be more seniors, um, pretty much not just the US, around the world, than people to take care of them and children growing up. The demographics are that staggering. Um, in Japan right now, they're saying by 2020, they will have more people in adult diapers than children diapers. And wow. by two Wow. It's, I, I mean, Jeez. if you think about it, uh, remember how many diapers you went through for your kids? So all of a sudden, you're dealing with this with your elderly loved ones. You've got your kids at home, and then all of a sudden, you're taking care of your parents. And you don't even think of yourself as a caregiver. Um, and I'm sure all of you have gone through this. It starts by just doing a few things for one of your parents. And next, you're worried about them 24-7. I'd like to get to some of the uh, <laughs> things that really strike home at the heart of this, which are the emotions that you feel when this happens to you. Yeah, well, I have worked in the field of aging for over 30 years. And yet, uh, in caregiving for my own family, it's still hard. You know, so I can imagine people who aren't steeped in this in the way that I am, how challenging it is. My uh, dad is 89 and has Alzheimer's disease. My mom is 86 and has uh, had a stroke over 20 years ago. And she um, is uh, getting increasingly frail. About four years ago, I moved from Washington, D.C. to Phoenix to take care of them to help give them more support, and they moved into a senior living community, I moved into their house. And then about a year ago, my parents moved back in the house with me because they needed 24-hour care. Um, both of their conditions had increased to the point where they couldn't be alone at all. And it was just too expensive to provide the care in the senior living community where they were. It was totally unexpected. Um, my mother was an artist. And the first thing that went were her hands all crippled up. Mm -hmm. Then she couldn't walk. Then she became completely immobilized. And I had had her in a couple um, assisted livings. But even when you do that, you still have to oversee everything. I just got so angry one day. I just went to the owner and said, get him, you know, get him off the golf course, get him here. I'm ripping my mom home. And that was when I brought her home to live with me. And the emotional part is that's the loneliness. No matter how many people you're surrounded with, you have family, you have caregivers, but you still feel so alone. Yeah. Probably when it's especially your parents because you feel that nobody could take care of them, nobody knows them as well as you do. So it's hard to give up that control emotionally too. A lot of parents have difficulties handing the reins over. They don't want to hand the car keys over, but they also don't want to lose their independence and they don't want to become a burden. It was the hardest thing in the world to be 3,000 miles away. I, I get a little emotional even telling you about it because even though I was doing everything I could possibly do, I couldn't quit my job and give away my children. Every, even though I was doing everything I could possibly do, I didn't feel like I was doing much and I didn't feel like I could be with them. So that was very tough. I felt the same way and you can see why I picked up my entire life and moved across the country. Yes. I'm lucky that I feel like I got involved earlier stage than Beth you were describing and that we do have a great deal of joy and I make a point of creating joy and having fun moments together. It's not easy. You know, I recently took them out. We had a hair appointment, a chiropractor appointment. I had to get the air in the tires. I took them to the mall to celebrate their anniversary. I was exhausted by the end of it. But it's worth it. You know, in the meantime, I'm dealing with incontinence and having to get them both in the bathroom. My dad can't do it by himself. I mean, 
but we still try to incorporate fun and joy in our lives. I did that too. I took mom out and we had we did have joy. There there were highs, absolutely. I think for me one of the hardest part was dealing with doctors and yeah. how to stand up with doctors. You know, the over medication, um, the just questioning doctors, um, you know, just making sure that they have the best care and if something goes against your instincts that a doctor or nurse is providing you have to you have to question them I always say one. my job is not to be their best friend my job is to advocate for my parents exactly yes. Amy. Yes. and it's really important that people think and take time for themselves because this is so debilitating not just watch your parents go through it but the focus as you were saying, Amy, you know, during the time you were doing it, you were exhausted afterwards. I mean, it is exhausting. It is a full-time job. Hired caregivers, I don't know how they do it. I have a mother who lives in Connecticut, and I live in Los Angeles. She will not tell me when she goes to the doctors unless she's in the hospital, and then she doesn't tell me. A friend of hers tells me. Mm -hmm. um, and when I am there, she doesn't want anyone in, to go in to the doctors to know actually how bad it is. But when I go and I see that she's on oxygen more than I anticipated she's on oxygen, you know, I've got a mom who's in denial and I'm trying to help her through it. For me right now, the caregiving uh, industry is about doctors and not being afraid to stand up. I mean, do, you know, don't be frightened to be a pain in the neck with doctors. My father was in the emergency, well, ICU for about eight days and between the family, we all rallied and we made it a point of when he got up in the morning of someone being there, even when he fell asleep till midnight and any time they brought in medicine, and I highly recommend this for all families, check, get the list out and check and say, what is that? What is that each time? If it's four times a day, if it's eight times a day. About a year and a half ago, my mom fell and fractured her spine and couldn't walk and that began 40 days in the hospital and I was with her 24-7 all but five nights of that and if I hadn't been there caring for her every step of the way there were medication mistakes uh, she was in a nursing facility for rehab and had a, a medication reaction and the doctor told me oh old people just get that way so many families today are separated and are not close by enough to really be there with the doctor visits and that sort of what can they do to feel a little bit less helpless or more involved for a lot of people it can be helpful to hire a geriatric care manager who yeah. lives where your where your loved ones are another thing that's great coming up are all the new apps that you can use for telehealth so something happens your parents can actually do blood pressure themselves and it goes directly to the doctor and there are easy ways to set that up so every time it's not another doctor visit I think it'd be great to hear from everybody you know what you know looking back if I knew then what I know now sort of um, viewpoint what you would have done when your parents were healthy to prepare. The, the number one thing first is to make sure that all of the legal things are in place. The power of attorney for health care and finances, the li advanced directives, the living will, um, and just it, that you, you do those legal things but then what about all the other financial issues like the credit card records and the PIN numbers and all the specifics that you know people don't think about when they go to set up the advanced directives. I found that it took me a lot of time to try and figure out my dad's system and find all of these things. I actually have a, um, a book coming out for AARP in uh, October called Juggling Work and Caregiving. And in that, I gave a list of all the kinds of information you need to gather. And it's great if you can get started that way before you know, you're really in a crisis situation. And I think it's also nice to have a list somewhere in that book where you have all the legal papers is things that you like. What if something happens and you can't speak for yourself? What kind of music do you like? What kind of food do you like? You know, um, a list of your friends. Do you have a pet? Who's their vet? Um, I think that's all of our, a part of being prepared to, for it, too. I think another thing that people don't take in consideration is all of a sudden you decide that you are aging in place which is what most of the country likes to do stay at home with that anytime you have a change made to your house if you've been living on the second floor and all of a sudden stairs are going to become a problem take in consideration what does it take 
you know, in your late 60s or 70s if you're making changes. Does the den downstairs, could that become your bathroom? Can you add an elevator? Do you, is this, um, do you need to do anything to your bathroom when you're adding grab rails or just in the shower? You know, if you're doing tweaks around the house, add things that you may not think you need, but all of a sudden when they're there, it makes such a difference because you usually don't add anything until something happens. And you don't want to have a fall where you break your hip. It's easier to have things in place that are preventative, and that's what people don't take in mm -hmm. consideration. I was at a friend's the other night, and he's in his 50s, and he got his mother um, a life alert system. with It's a PERS, one of them. It wasn't life alert, but it was one that has GPS. And I said, did you think of getting one for yourself? And he said, wait a second, I've got it right here. He said, the only way I could get my mom to use it was by picking one up for myself. He said, I carry it everywhere. <laughs> I found it in a garage. Who knows? And it's like you press it, someone speaks immediately. Why not? Why not have it in our purses now? Why right. not make it easy? And I love what you said, that that was how he motivated her to do it. People yes. ask so often, how do I get my parents to make changes? How do I talk to them about doing things like their advanced directives? And if you, if I, I always say, do it yourself. AARP has an initiative about this right now, and it's called Decide, Create, Share. And they are encouraging everybody to do this, because this is one of those things to make these plans, even though nobody likes to think about this. If you're taking care of your parents now, it's very likely we're all projecting, this is going to be me. My sister, my oldest sister, has been very ill, and I'm also her power of attorney, and that sort of thing. She's having surgery tomorrow morning. Today... She finished her advanced directives and emailed them to me. Oh. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's because we've been talking about it, and, you know, I said, you've got to have all these things in place, and I need to know what you want. And, you know, you, you sometimes do. She's 61. She's, you know, not doesn't seem like impending death. You know, you don't think about doing these things ahead, but all of a sudden, you needed to have it done. So I, I can't urge people enough to look at that 40-day challenge for the Decide, Create, Share from ARP. Each of us have a lot of horror stories personally, and we've all heard them. We could all tell them. I would love to switch gears for a minute. What can we find in it? Is there a silver lining in all this fact that so many people are going to be caregivers? How do you find the silver lining, and how do you find the balance. We had kitty cocktail hour on the bed every day. We would have at five o'clock the cats would come on the bed. I'd get the vodka. Mom would have something in her sippy cup and um, we would put on music. Some of us would dance. People would stop by during a certain time and we could make it fun. There I have a couple you know great memories about this time. I know that sounds ironic but it's true. We did we laughed a lot. We told a lot of stories and it wasn't that they were dying before our eyes. This is a process and um, they lived lived across the street toward the end uh, from a Dairy Queen and one of our rituals was that I would go across the street and get them anything they wanted, you know, no, not worried about the calories or the fat and come back and um, I would read to them and I would pick out a book that I thought they both would enjoy and they loved that. They absolutely loved hearing my voice, hearing the stories, sipping in their shakes and eating their ice cream. It was it was a lot of fun, actually. My mom has always been terrified of losing her teeth. And there was this one day when she was eating a Pepperidge Farm cookie, cracker, and she said, my God, these are so hard. And I said, no, they're not. And so I said, spit it out. So she spit out like a half a tooth. <laughs> and I said, Mom, you spit out a half a tooth. And she just went into panic. She was so terrified. She goes, well, what are we going to do? Nobody's going to come to the doc to the house now. Where are we going to get a dentist? I, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to put it under the pillow, and we're going to see what the tooth fairy brings the next morning. <laughs> but this was after I looked in. I made sure there was no pus, no bleeding. It was just a clean 89-year-old break. So, you know, you can take these situations that, you know, are so tragic and just lift her right out. And the next day, I put her favorite candy under the pillow so she could rot out another tooth. You've got to maintain your sense of humor, whether it takes vodka or sex or whatever, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes to make it fun. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I was originally a music therapist, so music is a huge thing for me, and that's one of the things that creates joy and, and breaks tension in our lives. My dad um, loves to sing, and you'll, if you go on my YouTube channel, you'll see lots of little videos of daddy singing, and he's, he's got a great sense of humor, 
and we do. We kind of break it, break the tension with a joke, with a song. I'm right. with them. I'm with them, and I, you know, we I, we enjoy meals. We try to do a Friday adventure once a week, and you know, it's it's those are the things that I know. Looking back, those are the things I'm going to remember. I know that I'm going to have remember those stressful moments, but if I don't create those other memorable moments, I won't have good things, and, and my parents are very special, and I want to enjoy that. Especially with Alzheimer's disease, it's, it's this particular challenge, and as my dad's oh. abilities start to, to go away, you know, it's just, it's a long goodbye. It's a horrible, long grieving process. So. And I, you know, if you focus on, Daddy can't do this anymore, uh, it's just, I'd be horribly depressed all the time. I have to focus on, oh, Daddy just did did something that, you know, Daddy can still sing the words of that song. And because I know there's going to come a day when you won't be able to do that. So I have to enjoy those things while I can. That's a wonderful way of thinking of this whole subject and really appreciate all of your perspective. Thanks so much for being here with us on Woe. Hope to have you back again.